Uh, we have a panel, as I said, the first panel uh, that is part of the strategies for transformative global leadership. The title is Redefining Multilateralism. And uh, this obviously is part of this, this uh, cooperation between the Office of the United Nations at Geneva and the World Academy of Art and Science. Uh, the uh, eminent speakers are gathering. I will start with a presentation of each and every one. I, uh, we have the honor of having Vaira Vike Freiberger, who just spoke, a psychologist, president of Latvia. Uh, she is the first woman to head a post-communist Eastern European country. And as Gary said, she's also a fellow of the World Academy. Sandrine Dixon de Clerv, she's co-president of the Club of Rome, also an energy policy expert and inter alia advisor to the European Commission presidents. Ambassador Tibor Tot, former executive secretary of the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, the CTBTO. He is a recognized authority on disarmament and non-proliferation and fellow of the World Academy. Alexander Likotal, historian, professor at the Geneva School of Diplomacy, former president of the Green Cross International and advisor to President Mikhail Gorbachev. David Chikweize, chief of cabinet to the director general of the United Nations Office at Geneva, former director of the UN Library, a seasoned diplomat and an expert in multilateral affairs. He is also a fellow of the World Academy. Aline Ware is a campaigner in the area of peace, nonviolence, nuclear abolition, international law, women's rights, children's rights, and the environment. He has served as global coordinator for parliamentarians for nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament since its foundation. So you see, we have really authorities in this field to talk about redefining multilateralism. I will start with the first question. We'll start with uh, President Byron, and then we'll take an order. I will remind everybody uh, the order we have predefined, but I will remind everybody when it's time to speak. So each speaker, we will go for five rounds of questions. And then of course, we'll take questions from, the, from participants. Uh, please take three minutes, no longer, for each reply. Global issues such as armed conflicts, climate change, migrations, armed conflict, pandemics, pose growing threats to peace and human security. In view of global interdependencies, multilateral institutions are essential, even if some cases, in some cases, their credibility has been substantially eroded by inaction and lack of solidarity. We just heard this remark from the, both the Director General of uh, UNOG of the United Nations at Geneva and by the President, the, sorry, the Secretary General of WHO, lack of solidarity. As the fragmented response to COVID-19 is showing, more global coordination is certainly needed among governments and institutions. Many feel like a radical change, a reorientation of international institutions is necessary. President Vaira, do you also think so? Uh, and how would you proceed to introduce changes and how to make things work better? The, that is a, the most difficult question of all uh, that is facing us all. Uh, I'd like to reiterate what I believe to be the main barriers to us moving forward. Uh, the world order that was put in place after the disaster of the Second World War was put in place by the victors in that war, uh, who then uh, co-opted China to join them in the permanent members of the Security Council. So right from its inception, uh, the United Nations uh, built in a fatal flaw into its structure and its possibility of being a world organ uh, with truly 
decision-making powers uh, that uh, could move forward uh, in spite of some opposition from some of its members. The veto power given to the five permanent members has been a paralyzing uh, effect on, on many decisions uh, within the uh, General Assembly. We know, of course, that there have also been coalitions within the General Assembly, and those uh, naturally represent various vested interests, which are part of human nature, and they uh, remain in place. What has been changing uh, in recent decades is, I believe, the, the ability of the general population uh, to feel themselves uh, more uh, in, empowered and, and able uh, to be informed of what is happening in the world, sadly to be misinformed as well, uh, but to participate virtually to what is going on in the world. Uh, when um, somebody is killed, uh, quite illogically, uh, a civilian in his own country, uh, killed by the forces supposed to ensure the internal security of that country. We see citizens rising up, not just in that country where it happened, but in other countries in the world. So that the ills that are, uh, the population is suffering in one place are instantly also shared by those in another. This is going to change the general climate within which leaders, those who are entitled, those who have been democratically elected, those who have seized power on their own or are or keeping power, uh, uh, illegitimate power uh, by force, uh, all of them will have to bow eventually to the pressure of public opinion. Once a critical mass of conviction and of uh, common conviction about what it is that is wrong and what needs to be different. If we say we do not wish to have police brutality, then that idea will become a rallying flag, not just where, for the people for where it happened, but elsewhere as well. The rallying flag is something that has to be there. That is the leadership we're looking for. And I think those who have ideas that are helpful, constructive, that help evolution rather than uh, entropy and destruction, uh, they have to use every opportunity that the modern media of communication are giving us to reach a larger and larger public and to build up this critical mass of people of goodwill who are not necessarily idealists and selfless saints, but who are ready to act uh, in terms of their enlightened self-interest, which coincides with that of everybody else on our planet. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Vaira, Rike Freiberger, for reminding us of the importance of this enlightened uh, uh, um, self-interest, but you know, not the entrenched interests that we heard from the previous uh, intervention that you made. Uh, now is the turn of Sandrine, Sandrine Dixon de Clerc. I would like to ask Tibor Toff, uh, another of our distinguished panelists to turn on uh, his camera, please, because he will be next, uh, or one of the next, yes, he will be next. Sandrine, uh, just to remind you the, the end of my question, um, do you also think that we need a radical change? Do you also think that we need a reorientation of international institutions? And, and how would you proceed? So I don't only think it, I think that as uh, has been said now uh, in the opening remarks and, and also by the former president, it's clear that the demonstrations in the street and the way in which we are seeing that the UN institutions are under attack, not only from the United States in terms of the World Health Organization, but also pulling out funding at the level of the UN, that if we don't change, then the UN will become a totally outdated body. So that would be my first statement. It's not a question of thinking, it's a question of doing. And I think that we have no choice but to rethink how the institution should function. And we'll get into, obviously, Donato, some of those granular discussions as we move through this panel. But then the next question is, how do we seize the opportunity in the 21st century that is before us of the key tipping points of climate change, health, and biodiversity? 
The Club of Rome already one year ago, and this built very much on 50 years of understanding the limits to growth and the fact that we will never have one singular shock, but we will have a series of shocks, as was very much said by Donella Meadows, believes that we are in a planetary emergency. And I see that Isdar's very good comment already in the chat indicates the same. We are no longer in the same political dynamic that we were when we set up the Bretton Woods institutions. We are now in a completely new type of thinking, both in terms of the convergence of the tipping points, but also in terms of timelines. We don't have the same amount of time in terms of negotiations, in terms of the modalities of socio-political interfaces, the power games, the real politique that we had in the past. I mean, we didn't have them before, but now I would even say that because of the great existential risk that faces us, if the UN, in the way in which the Secretary General has been so forceful in the last couple of years at most of the COP negotiations and indicating that this is not just about climate, this is about the greatest existential risk to humanity. From there then, we need to look at the new consciousness that is before us. COVID-19 is the greatest experiment we have ever seen in new human behavior. And therefore, we must tap into that new consciousness that actually when people are forced to shift, they do so because of threat. That is very important, not in saying that we need to continue with disaster reduction, but instead in saying that we need to design resilience into our systems so that we can ensure that actually we can confront future shocks. So designing a U new UN institution, which also then is much more at an interface and a bridge with people, understanding the links with non-state actors, not as much getting involved in the power games, but bringing in the multidisciplinary and the multi-stakeholder discussions that are fundamental in terms of moving forward, which means breaking down the silos, having worked in the UN before at SC for All, Sustainable Energy for All, as the new SDG on energy, knowing full well the power games that happen within the institutions at a time when it's absolutely fundamental to be collaborating and to be also downsizing to be much more impactful. So I will conclude by saying, let's use this new consciousness, let's understand the convergence of these tipping points, and let's all work together to rethink the institutions, the multilateralism that we need, that is actually 21st proof, 21st century proof. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandrine. Tibor, Ambassador Todd, the discussion is, is picking up. Uh, and uh, now we, you, you have the challenge. I mean, in, in fact, we, it, it obvi it's obvious that we can't wait. We have to change. So how, how do we change, Tibor? How do we build resilience? How we make sure that we don't fall into the trap of continuing the same mistakes over and over again? And uh, how do we build resilience, as, as Sandrine said, to, to avert this, this series of shocks? We don't hear you. We don't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Um, thanks, uh, and uh, a big hello to everyone. I would uh, start first uh, with trying to identify more closely the problem before we address the medicine. And uh, my feeling is that a uh, super bubble might be a good reference point to describe what might potentially, might potentially grow out of independent crisis coming together and clustering together. The danger with this super bubble is the different components like the COVID-19. I myself uh, five years ago was referring to a security bubble which uh, was growing since the mid 1990s. And uh, we were referring in many instances to the, the economic and social crisis. So one the, once these elements are coming together, this is what makes them very difficult to manage. And it reminds me 
there are many references to the 1930s, but probably a better reference point is the late 19th century, where uh, out of nothing practically, as a problem of managing multiple crises, uh, the lack of leadership, uh, another historical super bubble blew up. So that's, uh, that's my feeling that it's more than uh, any crisis during the last 10 years potentially. As for the medicine, I, uh, I try to be realistic how far we can overhaul the present system. We have to be aware that the UN, yes, grew out of the Second World War. The League of Nations grew out of the First World War. The Concert of Europe and the European conferences of the 19th century from 1815 onwards grew out of the Napoleonic War. So practically the previous systems the previous global mechanism to deal with the challenges grew out of major calamities, but they were more than calamities, they were meltdowns, um, uh, security, political, geopolitical meltdowns. So I don't think that we should be too quick to unravel the system we have. Uh, the system faces the following challenges. There is an existential challenge to the existing arrangements, treaties, organizations. So from my own area, uh, security, I would mention um, Open Sky, an arrangement which came down. The Conventional Force Reduction Treaty came down. Uh, there is a danger, there is a danger that by 100 cuts, arrangements like the World Trade Organization potentially even the World Health Organization might, might suffer some existential, existential blows. Second challenge, the geopolitical fight which is going on, uh, the organizations and in, uh, global arrangements are becoming the scene of uh, fighting out some of the geopolitical and other uh, problems. Deregulation as a result of the shrinking resources available, there will be unfortunately a potential turn away from some of the issues, at least in certain countries turning away from environment. We witnessed it already in 2008 and 2009. It might be coming back or lack of interest to regulating new areas. There will be a problem for intergovernment organizations on budget even if it is not for political reasons, as a result of the shrinking budgets and the need to rebalance the budgets after this unbelievable injection of uh, trillions of dollars, the budget of these organizations might be shrinking. With less money, they cannot do much more. There might be an issue of micromanagement faced by these organizations where countries feel that they have to intervene even more directly than before. They might treat these organizations as extended hands, where they practically try to surpass programs and budgets and the normal uh, tools. There could be a drifting and hollowing as a result of all of that. I see all uh, challenges as a potential and we might have uh, uh, in, in the next round more time to, to address them. I think that the organizations will have to turn many of these challenges into opportunities. So if there is a lack of interest in regulation, for example, be ready for the moment when the dust will settle. Okay, so do your work now because as an example, new technologies, there is an increasing gap between um, uh, the industries representing the so-called existing technologies and the new technology holders, uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon, and so on. There will have to be a closer look where it might be needed that regulations on the global level are relevant. If not now, then once the dust of the crisis will settle, and by that time there is a need to have the fine tune uh, ready as well. So my message is, uh, this is a potential super bubble. 
there is existential and other threats to organizations. We cannot undo them, but we have to be smart about turning all the challenges into opportunities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Tonks, uh, for reminding us also of the various constraints that certainly need to be faced in this, uh, uh, in this change, in this, uh, in this paradigm change that definitely is needed. Next speaker is uh, Alexander. Alexander, uh, the question again for you, uh, how do you think that we can change and can we change swiftly? Can we reform the United Nations system? Can we reform multilateralism? Thank you very much, Donato. And um, hello to everybody. It's such a pleasure and it's exciting to see the familiar friends' faces after several months of seclusion. You know, um, Henry Kissinger said once that the New World Order is not installed as an emergency measure. But for its emergence, the world needs extraordinary circumstances. And it looks we have no shortage of them. And uh, many people spoke about the changes of the world order, which were connected to different world wars. Today we have many problems, and we even call this crisis a perfect storm. But uh, the adequate question at the time of crisis is how to get out of the crisis, minimizing the costs. However, if we, if we will forget and focus only on this pandemic, not taking into account systemically all the things connected to this pandemic, we will be in square one. Therefore, local governance indeed needs not just you know, modern institutions reform, because of their credibility and uh, uh, substantial, because they substantially eroded by inaction and lack of solidarity, it was, as was brought out by the head of the uh, World uh, Health Organization. But uh, we need to revise and remodel them because of their inadequacy and inefficiency. And it has become ever present crying and overwhelming. Redefining multilateralism will not be enough. We'll have to reinvent multilateralism. In the world of 7.7 .7 billion people, it is no surprise that our global system is more complex than at any other time in history. In 1945, when the building blocks of the current global system were collected, it is today, obviously, it's not a surprise that it is uh, more complex than uh, at any other moment in history. And uh, the, you know, global economy after World War II, exports comprised a near 5% of global GDP. Today, that percentage is roughly five times higher, even as global GDP has increased multifold as well. The communications, the cornerstone of international relations has radically changed by electronic and social media, by smartphones, by internet. The number of people using the internet has surged over the past year with more than one million people coming online for the first time each day since January 2018. The world is not just more complex, it is also changing ever faster. And I want just to name three main consequences of this transformation. The first one, the world international system has become inclusive. For the first time in the history of mankind, the international system covers nearly the whole humanity, while until recently, practically until, until the fall of the wall in Europe, all that was not related to Europe or to the United States was simply called periphery, which says enough. Today, by contrast, the periphery is central, at least regarding 
conflictuality if we look at the world today. The second element is the mutation, very deep mutation of the nature of conflict. Wars used to be a matter of competition between powers. Today we have the feeling that weakness is replacing power and that power cannot any longer function as central explanatory term of conflictual situations, which are rather manifestations of state weakness today. Syria, endless nightmare, presents far more dangerous threats to global peace than superpower rivalry tra tra transiting today into economic domain. This new form of conflictuality completely turns the international environment upside down. The third aspect is, of course, mobility. Our international system used to be fully based on the idea of territory and boundaries, on the idea of fixity establishes that it is exactly the boundaries and fixity that establishes the competences of states, according to the, the definition given by Max Weber. But today, this territorial notion of politics is changed by a full range of mobilities. These are the three indicators that illustrate the deep transformation of the nature of the international relations. And as a result, the notion of interstate relations no longer captures the entirety of the global game. Look at the Black Lives Matter movement spreading across the world like a wildfire. It is not just anti-racist or national or ethnic. It is much more profound. And to a large extent, this was provoked by the existing global governance system inadequacies. A key driving force behind them is a deep awareness of the need for radical change, not reforms to a sometimes in the past perfectly engineered system but the desire to replace the entire mechanism and start anew. The traditional world order seems to be today too tight for development of humankind. It's like when a teenager all of a sudden finds his genes too tight, having simply grown up of his clothing. We need to change, not just clothes. Instead of international, we need to develop intersocial forms of effective multilateralism to face global challenges and the opportunities as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Thanks a lot. You say reinvent, reinvent multilateralism. David, uh, you, you heard the previous speakers. I mean, uh, again, we're building knowledge throughout this process. We're building perspectives. We're talking, uh, Alexander uh, concluded saying, you know, three are the elements that we should take in, in mind, inclusiveness, mutation, mobility. Do you also agree that uh, the multilateral system has to be reinvented or you think we can, as uh, some other um, speakers said, we can still reform it one way or another? Unmute yourself, we don't hear you. Or volume, please. Volume. We don't hear you. We don't hear you. Uh, I, I ask for technical assistance from support, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, we now hear you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Donato. I wanted to start by uh, saying that it's a great pleasure and honor to be uh, part of this uh, conference, uh, probably one of the largest uh, undertakings uh, on, on this scale of five days. It's also an honor to be uh, on this panel, which is an opening panel, leading panel with such eminent personalities. Um, and I uh, also want to say as if not the co-parent, but as at least the midwife of this conference, that it's a great pleasure that it has started off. I want to thank uh, Gary Jacobs for being the real parent 
of this and Donato uh, and for starting us off on a good foot. Um, I like, uh, you know, always uh, enjoy precise questions. What would I do with global governance if I was a leaf for an hour? Well, I uh, have no such pretenses to be a leaf for an hour. However, um, I think uh, what we need to do is uh, think, as, uh, as Tibor Toth said, we need to first look at the problem. And uh, without uh, being a uh, uh, you know being defensive about this as a, as a current UN staff member, and uh, without jumping to uh, to the uh, uh, solutions, um, I would like to um, say that uh, the criticism I've heard of the UN uh, needs to be defined first. Which UN are we talking about? Are we talking about the UN Secretariat, the UN staff members in different organizations, uh, etc. Are we talking about the member states? Uh, unless we define that, uh, we're not going uh, places. Number one. Number two, um, yes, of course, the organization was created in 1944-45 by the victors, obviously. But the, um, the, uh, the leaders of that time uh, stepped up to the plate and created what they thought was right for that lay of the land. I'm looking around. Uh, I was uh, very closely involved with the 50th anniversary of the UN. I was involved with many other uh, anniversaries. Uh, we have the 75th anniversary. I'm sorry, I don't see world leaders stepping up to the plate to improve and change their organization. What we get instead is beating up on, uh, on the uh, UN without defining what they're talking about, cutting funding, and getting uh, succeeding secretaries general to uh, be introspective and cut this and cut that. Uh, it's akin to uh, the chair of the, uh, the board of directors of a private company hiring a president calling him to, uh, or her, uh, into a meeting and saying, okay, uh, you're president. Now, uh, take this much money uh, from the cupboard, uh, hire 100 people and start working. Says, yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what do I produce? We'll tell you later, you just go start. Can you run a business like that? No. Can you run an international organization like that? No, you can't. So the owners, the main owners, the creators, need to uh, need to take care of their own organization. I will, I fully agree that the organization, as an organization of member states, is not working. Some say we need to enlarge the number of countries having uh, veto power and enlarge uh, the number of uh, members of the Security Council. Do you think if we can't have uh, consensus with 15 members and five veto wielding members, do you think we're going to be able to do that with 15 and 35? I doubt it. What is needed is, uh, is a change in the mindset of the owners of the organization. And, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not an easy uh, prospect. Um, unfortunately, we have, uh, you know, as much as we want to talk about uh, the, the warm and fuzzy sort of let's do this and let's do that, human nature, I'm sorry, has seen through decades, centuries, and millennia that conflict and hunger for power and wealth are the driving force. What we have managed to do in the 20th century is to curb that through a body of legislation, of international law, that puts a cap on these things. So what we need to do is to continue uh, to create this legislation. However, we also need those who sign to uh, adhere to the legislation, because otherwise it becomes a dead letter, it becomes a piece of paper. By, uh, by the same token, um, you know, there's uh, especially the, the feeling that, oh, we can't uh, work together, there are so many opponents, so many enemies, and so on. Well, maybe one thing we ought to do is group all the global problems, all the 
climate and the poverty and the everything together. Call that collectively an enemy and address that. Then everybody would have a chance to wind up. And if that happens, if that kind of paradigm shift in the thinking can be done, then perhaps uh, the next step of working through the existing organizations and at the same time fine tuning them. What doesn't work, fix it. You know, uh, a very wise person said in the, during the 50th anniversary of the UN that if the UN didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. Now that it exists, we have to reinvent it. So uh, this is the, uh, the basic uh, crux of the problem we have. Um, I'll leave it at that and uh, chip in on uh, other questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. It's true, we cannot do without the United Nations. And uh, so many people around the world feel the same. Uh, I, I have been a witness of that, certainly in many peacekeeping missions. Uh, and political affairs missions in the past. Alin, uh, it's your turn. We have really, we have to be uh, sharp as you are, I mean, uh, concise, a uh, few minutes because we have another, other rounds of questions. Uh, so I remind everybody to stay within the three minutes. Alin, what is your perspective around this? And uh, especially you that you deal with so many parliamentarians around the world, probably you also have a different feedback from other speakers. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Renato, and thank you to all the speakers before me, all of who had, you know, wonderful truths and ideas and stuff. I probably would concur slightly more with the perspectives of Tiber Toth and David Eschweitzi with regards to the value of the United Nations, um, and that if we didn't have the United Nations now, um, I don't think that it would be politically possible to establish something as good as what we've got. It's not perfect, we know that, but nor is it the same as what it was in 1945. And it's not just the United Nations, it's part of it. Other multilateral systems, treaty body organizations, other regional organizations, which all play an inter interactive role and which we can use. None of which are perfect, but all of which we can use. Now, I come from New Zealand, a very small country, and the United Nations has been vital for our security. Just a, a couple of examples. We had state-sponsored terrorism in our country, a powerful country, much bigger than us. We couldn't, you know, military respond to them, but they sunk a peace boat in our harbour. And then when we caught the two agents, uh, this country put an economic boycott on us and was powerful enough to move the whole European community to join it. Um, how did we resolve that? Through the United Nations, through the mediation services of the UN Secretary General. People don't really know this, but it was incredible that we managed to use the UN to resolve that. Similarly, nuclear testing in the Pacific, which was creating radionuclides that have long-term transgenerational impact. And there were three countries doing these nuclear tests. Again, through the UN was really important. We managed to end the nuclear testing in the Pacific. New Zealand and Australia took a case to the International Court of Justice against France, and that forced them basically to stop. I mean, there were other initiatives as well. Um, there are many other examples. As a civil society person, I'm not a New Zealand government, a civil society person, uh, we, we, we wanted to oppose nuclear weapons and to take a case to the International Court of Justice. We were against the permanent members of the Security Council, all the NATO allies, but we used the UN General Assembly and the World Health Organization, and these are like one nation, one vote. So we had the power of the majority of the world and we managed to beat the nuclear arms states and get our case into the International Court of Justice. And that has set basically the, the, the norm of non-use of nuclear weapons under international law. These are just a few examples. There are so many examples of the value of the United Nations, particularly for civil society and for small states who you know, can't compete with the military power and don't want to. They don't want a, a world order based on the threat or the law of force, but rather on law and international mechanisms. So I think a key, key things here is how do we better educate the world and civil society about the use of the UN? Because so often you don't hear the success stories. 
you don't hear all the conflicts that are resolved. You don't hear the incredible work that's been happening out in the field with the UN Development Programme and the Peacekeeping Forces and the World Health Organization. All you hear is like when the United States, with their own administration's mismanagement of COVID-19, blames it on the World Health Organization when it was the World Health Organization that was providing really good medical advice and, and policy planning uh, for countries. Um, so we need education. We also need more support for the UN. I mean, the annual budget was about $6 billion. The global weapons budget is 1.9 trillion. So the UN budget is like one day of the military. Why don't we cut some of this military spending? If we had one week of the military spending, we'd have a lot more money to help the UN do its job a lot better, uh, as well as to implement the sustainable development goals, the economic measures required to come out of the pandemic. So cutting the military spending, I think, and reinvesting whether it's budgets or investments into human security, including the mechanisms, I think is a way to go. Of course, that's difficult because there are vested interests by the military industrial complex, but we have the power now because we can, whether we're, we can call on our banks or our universities or our cities or even our governments to stop investing in these destructive corporations, whether they're the military corporations or the fossil fuel ones, and we can shift those investment dollars into the sustainable development goals to help uh, achieve those. So I think it's possible, and I think this new wave of the understanding that the military, the huge amount of money spent on the military was powerless to stop COVID-19 spreading around the world. It was useless in addressing the health and economic um, outfall of it or reconstruction. So I think there's probably, this is an opportunity to then shift that awareness into knowledge that let's now invest these resources in multilateralism uh, and that'll be much better for the world. And yes, we can reform the institutions as we go along, but the, there's enough value and enough opportunities within the institutions now that they don't have to be reformed to do good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Arlen. Excellent. You reminded us all how important it is to support the United Nations because of the all of the many achievements in so many areas. I mean, whether it's economic affairs, development affairs, human rights, um, human health, uh, education, etc. So, uh, so many the, the areas that the United Nations uh, focus on. Now we're talking of multilateralism as a whole, relations among governments and states. But I would like to. The first, the second round really go deeper into the elements of uh, uh, security, of human security. Uh, the current competitive security paradigm seems to ignore global threats such as climate change, as you said, financial collapse, rising unemployment, poverty, inequality. Um, shall we start with David, who is uh, our main partner in this program that we are conducting as WAS and the United Nations. What should be, David, for you, the definition of security in our interdependent world? Uh, and what forms of multilateral co cooperation can also help us guarantee respect of human rights and human dignity? Thank you, Donald. Can you hear me now? Yes, we do. Yeah. You're online. Um, Security is, uh, is something that uh, very often is mis uh, misrepresented and misunderstood. Rose? I don't understand. We don't hear you well. If you, you have probably to speak in front of the camera, we have a problem with your microphone. This is I what. I am in front of the camera. Yeah, yeah. There is a, an echo somehow, but. Uh, we now hear you loud and clear. Now you can? You can, yes. Uh, no, okay. Um, security is much more than just uh, military security. Uh, you still can't hear me. We are, we are, losing, we are losing David. Maybe, uh, although I wanted really to start with him, let's continue with Tibor. Are you there, Tibor? And then uh, we'll ask David to... Yes, I am. Yes. Tibor? Should I go ahead, Donato? Please go ahead and we'll try to fix the, the technical problems on David's side. Thank you, Tibor. Okay. So um, 
let, let me start with the following. Uh, before uh, addressing the definition, I, I would expand upon uh, the, the way security might work. And in that respect, I, I, I suggest to myself to make a step back from this concept of super bubble and to focus narrowly on, on security. Uh, my feeling is that we have to understand better uh, two phenomena of security. Uh, number one, that as it is in the financial economic world, um, security is cyclical as well. And as it is in the financial and economic world, it might be uh, derived from overinvestment into what I call competitive security versus cooperative security. So there is an obsession with uh, trying to uh, get uh, unilateral advantages instead of seeking uh, cooperation through, through different means. Where it is putting us based on that cyclicality, um, again, my feeling is that uh, since the mid 1990s, uh, we are uh, creating a bigger and bigger bubble of, of overinvestment into competitive security, number one. And number two, uh, it did not, it did not um, reach still uh, a, a stage where it can be even more frightening. So in my feeling is that the worst is still to come in terms of this uh, overinvestment. And what we will have to watch um, the canary in the mine and the canary in the mine are certain defining uh, uh, reference points in the area of security and because i was i have spent too many time a lot of time with with the test ban treaty the fate of the nuclear test ban treaty so if that treaty uh, will be challenged then it will indicate that we are really heading for very difficult times. The other feature to, to have a closer understanding of security is the continuum. There is a certain continuum how security has been historically mismanaged. Okay? And we are lucky as a generation, or we are lucky as two or three generations, that those calamities, which represented so many times, so many uh, centuries, in terms of the security landscape, wars and civil wars and uprising and the mix of all of them, uh, were probably at least in Europe from a European perspective less frequent. But it doesn't mean that we can really say this time is different. This time is different with a question mark as it was the title of a similar uh, publication with the subtitle 800 years of financial folly. Okay, and we have a similar phenomenon. So I think we have to factor in why we can say that those calamities which happened as a result of a similar super bubble, for example, at the end of the 19th century, will be better managed. There is an additional question about the, this clustering of different crises into crises in plural. And here, besides the enumeration, which is in your question, Donato, I would like to emphasize two aspects where I'm extremely concerned. It's very easy, sorry, it's not easy, but it's possible to have a market adjustment after a quick um, uh, financial problem, or even the 2008 or nine uh, adjustment. What might be more difficult to uh, bring back the faith of vast number of people in the system, be it a national governance system, a regional governance system, or a global governance system. So it's not so easy to have consecutive crises, financial, economic, social, and, and unemployment, and so on. And then to expect the generation, which, uh, which managed somehow to, to, to uh, go through that, or even the emerging generation, to say that, look, uh, I'm okay. 
and I'm ready for the next one. It might mean that there is a need to potentially write down, it's an ugly word, but to write down a generation or one and a half generation. And this bringing me to the next issue, the youth. All the big problems prior to the First World War and the Second World War was uh, somehow linked to the um, lack of faith and the disillusionment of, of, the you, of the younger generation as well. And we have to be careful that they are not hijacked again as they have been with very attractive radical ideologies. And it might be ideologies on the left and the right, but the, this uh, generation of millennials might be very, very sensitive because for the second time in their, in their three decades, two or three decades of, of existence, they are facing against, against something which our generation did not, uh, did not see. So I would like to mention these two areas in addition to the list you gave. I agree with you that these are part of the clustering uh, super bubble elements, but we have to watch the uh, crisis of faith and the crisis of the youth. Thank you, sorry. Thank you very much, Tibor. Crisis of faith, crisis of the youth. David, could you pick it up from there? Uh, are you with us? Yeah. I don't know if I can be heard now. Yes, you do. Okay, good. So I, had to, I had to do an impersonation of an air traffic controller. Sorry? <laughs> even, too, even too much, the volume. Lower the volume a bit. Okay, because I put everything on max. Hang on a sec, hang on a sec. Um, let me see. Is this no, better? Now. Is this Perfect. better? Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, I, I have a, a very similar approach to what Tibor was saying. Um, security is misunderstood uh, by many leaders and a lot of people as uh, the level of military hardware and, uh, and everything connected to that, especially those who have uh, nuclear weapons. Um, however, no country can be safe without a, a, a firm and a vibrant economy, without a, a good social um, policy, um, uh, safe um, uh, from the standpoint of climate, etc. There's one element here uh, which I want to zero in on um, without you know, talking about everything for a long time. It's the element uh, in the security um, sort of domain of disarmament. And the issue is that disarmament um, is uh, and has been since the early 60s, since uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, it uh, grew in the percentage of importance that it was accorded within the security uh, domain. Um, it's hard to say, um, you know, the level of, of concern or fear that was in the heads of the leaders, but a couple of years after, uh, you know, I don't want to go into the whole history and, and be long about it, but the basic issue is that uh, a number of international disarmament uh, treaties and instruments were created, among them multilateral. Uh, the Partial Test Ban Treaty, the, um, uh, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, just to name a couple. And they laid the basis for multilateral uh, disarmament diplomacy, which has been languishing for over 20 years in Geneva, uh, right next to my office here, uh, the Conference on Disarmament. Why? Because there's no will. And there's... Uh, that's a whole different uh, tragic story. I don't want to go into that right now. But the point is that uh, what we see today is a, uh, a decrease in the percentage that the leading member states, uh, the biggest uh, and most powerful member states, are according to the concept of disarmament within the security, within how they define their own security. And this is uh, actually uh, incredible uh, to see because in, how can you ask countries that are trying to obtain nuclear weapons not to do that 
when the countries that have the most nuclear weapons are actually coming back to uh, more and more reliance on what they have. Just look at the very, very recently in the last couple of days um, issued uh, CIPRI yearbook. Look at the figures there, they're elucidating. Um, and, and, and this is continuing in a situation where uh, technological progress is happening at such a pace that pretty soon, actually, nuclear weapons might even be obsolete. They may be, you know, the poor man's uh, weapon. We have uh, all kinds of uh, weapons that are uh, that may not even need a, a nuclear warhead. When you have hypersonic weapons, uh, something a projectile uh, t weighing ten tons, flying at uh, eight times the speed of sound, hitting something, you don't even need a, a nuclear or any kind of. Uh, uh, warhead there. So the concept of security is being skewered into the wrong direction. Instead of uh, opening it up to other uh, aspects and, and working together to define security for everybody, uh, the same concepts from the 20th century of you know, pushback, uh, hegemon, whatever you have, you know, you name them, they are still and they're being rehashed, not still, they're being rehashed. And they're being applied to especially the, the triangle of, of the most powerful countries, whether economically or uh, militarily. And unless they figure out their relationship, uh, the next tier of regional countries that have become much more aggressive, much more powerful, and much less uh, prone to asking their uh, sort of uh, leader, I'm harking back to the bipolar world, where they wouldn't get up in the morning without calling the, uh, the capital of their uh, leader of their coalition saying, well, I'm up in the morning, may I get up, uh, get out of bed. Um, now, they act on their own recognizance. They uh, don't ask permission. And this adds a very serious uh, next level of insecurity and instability. And the bottom line is that uh, this uh, skewered vision of security uh, is also uh, seen in parallel with uh, a zero sum approach, which is still there. So we have to, uh, when we talk about a paradigm shift, and we have to have the paradigm shift in our minds, in the minds of the, of the, uh, the countries. And last thing, I don't want to go over too much my limit, but uh, you know, we we are talking, and we will talk more about the civil society role and uh, youth and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, I'm sorry, the Westphalian system is alive and well, and uh, and. Uh, functioning with a vengeance. So it is about countries. It is about leaders of countries. Unfortunately, it's just that we have very mediocre leadership compared to the great uh, names of the past. That's, uh, uh, that's my view. Thank, thank you. David. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you very much. I don't want to cut you short because this is essential for our own research program. And all you say is extremely relevant. Uh, but I want to advance because we have so many questions for you. We want to learn more from you. So I ask you, really, I beg you to be as succinct as possible. Vaira, next uh, it's you. What is your sense of uh, security? What, how would you define security? Uh, you have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. Thank I, you. I'm on, I hope. My country has a, has a sad history of wishing to be neutral uh, at the time the Second World War was about to break out and being invaded by, from both sides, from the East and from the West, and, and uh, suffering two uh, totalitarian uh, occupations and, and, and 50 years under, under, uh, uh, after being uh, in, forcefully in illegally integrated. Um, this sort of thing continues to this day. A look at the situation in Yemen, in which forces from abroad uh, start invading the country. There's one of the, the most uh, horrendous um, humanitarian crises uh, currently uh, on the planet. But uh, not that many years ago, 
um, think to the situation of Ukraine in the context of uh, the uh, nuclear test ban treaty and, and the, the way nations handle the question of nuclear weapons. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Ukraine had a considerable nuclear arsenal. Uh, it gave it up, it handed over uh, everything uh, to the Russian uh, at the Budapest uh, Memorandum, guarantees from four great powers that would guarantee its security and its uh, sovereignty uh, in return. When Crimea was invaded and annexed by Russia, these, nothing was done, especially since one of the signatories was, was Russia in the first place. Uh, when the Donbass was invaded, uh, nothing happened and nobody could guarantee uh, this country's sovereignty and territorial integrity. This is a very bad example uh, uh, when we uh, address uh, leaders uh, of countries that are in the process of acquiring nuclear weapons and telling them that they shouldn't do it, which I fully think they should not, because there's plenty of them around and too many already. But the, the example of what happens when a country denuclearizes, uh, in the case of Ukraine, is extremely sad. As far as security of a general sort goes, uh, here again, the situation is rather sad uh, because all of us human beings are constantly uh, under a certain probability uh, of uh, failures uh, in, our, in our personal security. There is uh, a probability that is higher than zero of being struck by lightning, uh, of falling down and, and breaking some and getting serious injury, etc., etc. And of course, pandemics are there. Uh, the, the changes induced by climate change, by the polluted air of megacities already now, never mind 10 or 20 years hence, uh, these are all uh, dangers uh, that threaten millions and millions of people. Malnutrition uh, of children growing up into socially inadequate conditions. Uh, they are doomed uh, from their earliest years of life. Uh, they cannot hope to have the same life as those in more privileged situations. But meanwhile, uh, the situation being what it is, it is better, I believe, than it has ever been in the past in history. Uh, today, I think the number of people affected by uh, failures of security of various kinds is smaller than it has ever been. Even the people killed in armed conflicts is smaller than it has ever been. So we are making progress. The progress is slow. Uh, it, uh, sometimes it's one step forward and two steps back. But there is some sort of progress, and I think we have to keep pushing for the ideas, the concepts, and the methods, and the interventions, and the international bodies that do get results. We have to continue. We cannot let up. Thank you, Vaira. Uh, Sandrine, maybe you can pick it up from here. I mean, uh, maybe it's true we have less conflicts in one way or another, but civilians get trapped into conflicts and civilians are the very first victims in many situations around the world, in critical situations around the world. What is your sense of security or human security? Yeah, I, I want to build on, on the last two statements. So both on, on David's and Vira, because I think they're spot on, but I would maybe just like to build a bit more on that. So the first is absolutely the NATO. I mean, we are as vulnerable as the weakest link, right? We've seen it with COVID. And we also know that it is the world's most vulnerable that are at the front lines of all of the security issues, whether it be war, whether it be the flood of migration, whether it be climate change and, and also biodiversity loss. As well, obviously now with COVID, 75% of the deaths are predominantly the most vulnerable and in particular in the United States those that actually are in either poverty or also um, are of different races. So, so I think that we, we must admit, as I think many have hinted to, but I'd like to be much more blunt, that the budgets that go into military 
are definitely lost budgets. There is a perversity in the way in which we allocate our capital, which is still entrenched in an old model. That old model is that your defense system is strong when you have a strong military. We can see that the most resilient nations to COVID are those that actually have already been putting in place new economic models, either through well-being indicators or donut economics, and that is coming through, whether it be Scotland, whether it be Iceland, whether it be Finland, whether it be New Zealand, by the way, most of them are run by women as well, who have had a totally different approach to resilience than what we've had in the past, which is very much caught up in a power game and the need to show your force through the military. So today's security issues are completely different in the sense that if we don't unpack the food security issue, if we don't unpack the climate security issue, if we don't unpack the issues around the global commons, which by the way, we have not been chatting about, um, and the lack of systems approaches and the way in which we collaborate, we will have more wars. It's not that the wars are going to create these problems. It's actually now that these crises are going to create more wars, more conflict, and clearly more migration, which then will create more tensions. And then we will see the socio and political fallout around populism and fascist governments. So I think it's very important that we think in this way. Hence why we have been very much indicating across a variety of different budget lines that we need to totally shift the way in which we look at our national budgets and, and really bring capital to where it's going to create that resilience. And I'll just end with one last point. We also need to enhance accountability. We need to stop allowing and pussyfooting around those dictatorships that are actually destroying resilience, those that are actually pushing hate, those that are actually promoting distrust that we're seeing in the United States. I think nations need to stand up and be quite strong. If we're going to continue to try to enhance multilateralism, collaboration, and democracy, then we must stand up and start to voice our discontent with those leaders that are power mongers and going completely against a resilient globe to those crises that are going to be coming. Thank you very much, uh, Sandrine. I agree with you 100%. Uh, building resilience is the antidote to uh, really th this, this particular situation of uh, crisis and uh, of course also insecurity, human insecurity. Alin, would you like to pick it up from here? Be very short as you can be. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm quite happy to follow on from Sandrine because I was just on a webinar this morning with the Global Peace Index, which was looking exactly at what Sandrine was talking about. Uh, that is that uh, those uh, countries that are, have been focusing very much on human security aspects in their economy, putting you know, the investments into public health and environment, into uh, resilient economy and inclusion, um, these were the ones that are coming a bit, uh, that are coping with this economic fallout and the health fallout from the pandemic the, the most. And the Global Peace Index has the, um, the, 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 the research data on that. So I really recommend people to actually have a look at the Global Peace Index and their latest report, which is comparing you know, the, the human security framework uh, and resilience uh, out of this. Um, on the other hand, though, you know, there are some countries which do have general concerns about invasions and who place more of a focus on military security and protection of borders. Um, and too often, I think that these two concepts of security are placed in opposition to each other. You know, do you focus more on human security or defense of borders and protection of your country from invasion? I think that the UN comes in with a model that encompasses both. It's a common security model. It, it doesn't give up on the notion that you know, the territorial sovereign integrity and, and the countries have a right to protect themselves, but it comes in much stronger on saying that there is an obligation, one, to resolve international conflicts peacefully. That's Article 2 of the UN Charter. Two, it actually provides a number of mechanisms to do that. Now, it provides a range of mechanisms because depending on what type of conflict and which type of 
uh, other actors you're dealing with, one method may be better than other. There's mediation, there's negotiation, there's the use of regional organizations like the OSCE, for example, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, or there's recourse to the International Court of Justice or the Permanent Court of Arbitration or the Law of the Sea Tribunal. There's a whole range of mechanisms now to be able to resolve these issues in a common security approach. And what is a common security approach? It's one where you're working to resolve the conflict. It's one where you're looking at not just your needs, your nation's needs or your people's needs, but you also recognize that whoever you're dealing with also has needs. So it's not a competitive framework, it's a common security framework. And I think that needs to be emphasized more, that we do have these mechanisms that are available. They're not well enough known, they're not well enough used, and they're not totally subscribed to. Unfortunately, only 77 of the UN member states subscribe to the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. It should be most of the members of the of the United Nations should subscribe to the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice as one of these means for resolving conflicts in a common security and legal approach. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Alexander, would you like to add your voice to this particular point of security? No, we don't. Uh, everything will. No, we Almost everything was already touched in the previous um, contributions. I must say that security is always a perception and we should never forget that. Security is not something which is set for every country. It, it depends always on trust, on the trust in other countries, in other people, in other governments, etc., etc., etc. And trust is always dependent on quality of leadership and transparency of governance, including social control. There is no social control on governance. In, uh, and of course, I am talking about the necessary thing which was touched by Sandrine um, about the, the issue that we need to shift the way we look about budget allocation. I agree totally. But we shouldn't forget that budget allocation usually is being done not because of the evaluation of the security or even defense demands, but because of, because of the vested interests and domestic politics inside the countries. Everything today is very much intertwined. And uh, we act, actually we are entering the disruptive world of risk societies and still trying to govern in a business as usual mode. It used to be the case when uh, the feeling of security came to somebody when my tribe was more powerful than their tribe. Then my country is more powerful than their country. I was safe. Later, my alliance, NATO or Warsaw Pact or whatever, was more powerful than their alliance. And that provided the feeling of safety. It is no longer the case. In the modern age, where everything is connected to everything, and the most important thing about what you can do to enhance security today is what you can do with others. I mean, interconnectivity, interactivity, including international societies. Of course, 7 billion people have 7 billion agendas today, and we shouldn't forget about human security. And as already noted, thing, thinking about the big picture is relatively a rare luxury. A single mother somewhere struggling to raise her two children in Mumbai, Mumbai slum is focused on the next meal. Refugees in a boat in the middle of Mediterranean scan the horizon for any sign of land. And a dying man in Geneva Hospital today is gathering, gathering all his remaining strength to take in one more breath. They all have far more urgent problems that, than global warming or the crumbling arms control system. No roundtable discussion can do justice to all that. And I do not have lessons to teach people in such situations, but coming back to the current crisis, if we want to cure the disease rather than its symptoms, it's time, it's time to start thinking in terms of synergies and opportunities. 
and outside the usual multiple choice box of threats and priorities. Ad hoc map measures applied today everywhere in COVID uh, pandemic, in arms control, in any crisis is not a substitute to global governance and only new effective multilateralism can establish trust based not on traditional um, states balance of interests and power but on globally shared risks and concerns of people's communities thank you alexander you put the accent on trust we are receiving questions from uh, uh, online and i see there is a question on quality leaders and this is actually what I also wanted to ask you uh, out of the discussion uh, of what you're saying. There is, it seems to be a, an overall feeling of political leadership deficit and failure. Uh, instead of transformative leadership, we have been witnessing isolated efforts to react to the challenges according to where the noise uh, comes from. The systemic uh, lack, lack, the lack of systemic response actually seems to be one of the main reasons you pointed to that of multiplying crises that we face not only coronavirus but peace and security climate uh, food you just said water energy poverty so uh, uh, we should be able to anticipate these crises and their spillover and assemble also a first line of defense and then also deflate the super bubble that Tibor was referring to of the combination of lethal circumstances that generate a conflict or a pandemic. So what steps, and I will start with Sandrine, what steps can be taken to strengthen global capacity for crisis prevention? Uh, what knowledge is needed and, and what changes are required in the present multilateral architecture to prevent worse crises from occurring? Sandrine, please. Yeah, so, so you know, we're, we're very much struggling, and I'm going to be very honest here, even within the Club of Rome. C clearly, I think that we all, as, as our own leadership, um, need to bring forward some really deep questions within the current leadership, the absence of leadership, and then how we have seen history and how we see the future. And the way in which the, we have tried through the Club of Rome to better understand why it's taken us 50 years to actually get to this point of better understanding crises and also opening up the consciousness of more people rather than the usual suspects. For us, myself and, and also my co-president and the members, I think part of this has to come from understanding the importance of history but not being entrenched in history, understanding also the failures where we have not been able to demonstrate real leadership and then what the future is actually holding for us. Who are the leaders of the future? There was a whole conversation around the youth, but it's not just the youth, it's also women. It's also more diversity. We are having these conversations in boardrooms in many cases, but not necessarily at the highest level of government. Granted, some governments are actually starting to put in much more diverse ministries. And actually what we're seeing, if you look at governance, that it is those actually that do have the most diverse governance structure, as well as a much more integrated governance between ministries that are actually able to be much more resilient facing crises. And you can see that across local governments, as well as national governments, as well as the international level when we're looking at some of the UN agencies. So I think it's very important that we also then look at flexibility. And one of the biggest issues and the criticism of our multilateral system is the fact that it's not as flexible as it could be. And, and I think that that is a criticism that we see around the bureaucracies in most of our governance systems. So understanding that if we're going to emerge from emergency, we need to understand the past and have a very good understanding of where we're going, or at least trying to put in place a flexible system, which is able to move quite fast in reacting. It is there that we can start to design for disaster. If you look at the WEF report, 
for example, so the World Economic Forum. For the first time, the WEF has, in its risk assessment, brought in the emergency aspect that we've been talking about at the Club of Rome. It's the first time that it's actually integrated within the concept of how we actually deal with risk. In addition to that, the key risk indicators that came top across the board was climate, it was food, and it was migration. So the human dimension of all of this. So if we're going to look at leadership, we again have to see how our leaders are prepared to look at this. And then I guess I'll, I'll bring in the, the last point. So very much the anchoring of the learnings around what makes a good leader. It's to get, and again, we're seeing it in the chat, it's to get back to an element of trust, but also to an element of what is real leadership. I'm, I'm often confronted by the fact, and I have an American accent, but I would very much like to indicate to everyone that I'm French, Belgian, and feel very European, especially at this time. And I'll say this why, because I publicly on TV said that President Trump was not my president, even though I'm an American citizen, and was really criticized for saying that. Why is that? We have to stand up and say when our leaders do not represent our values. Our values being those that are much more human, that are looking at people first. That is what a leader should do. And what has happened is there are far too many leaders that are looking at power and that are trying to build egos, ego systems rather than ecosystems. And I think that is the demonstration of a real leader. But we need to hold those leaders accountable. So we can only do that if we obviously try to vote, but also speak up and ensure that those of us in different positions of power indicate very clearly when we do not see leadership and when we do see leadership. Thank you very much, Sandrine, for being blunt, direct, and realistic at the same time. Alain, would you like to continue? What is your opinion around this? What is prevention for you? Is it possible? Yeah, um, thank you. I'll just offer two points here. Um, uh, one is that, again, I will reassert the, the need for greater support for multilateral mechanisms and bodies that are doing fantastic work. Uh, we see incredible work from a number of the UN agencies out in the field, you know, UN Development Programme, the special, special envoys of the Secretary General on the glo global ceasefire, for example, um, but they're, they're not well supported in terms of providing uh, sufficient uh, personnel. Uh, we've seen that in a, in a, in a number of instances that uh, it, it needs you know, a lot more uh, capacity support. And uh, as I mentioned, compared to the amount of investment that goes into the military, $1.9 trillion, the amount we're investing in conflict prevention, crisis resolution, human security, multilateralism is very small. Um, I think there's a growing awareness about the need to refocus that investment and the value of multilateralism, crisis uh, 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 resolution, etc. Uh, so that's one area where I think we might be able to make some strides. And that's one thing that you know the ne network of parliamentarians that I'm uh, coordinating is taking a lot of action and looking at you know national budgets and what they can put into. Uh, the second thing also is, is where to look for leadership. Um, while I'd agree that we have to challenge the leadership at the top level, and we have different models, I think the model of uh, the Prime Minister of my country is very different, New Zealand, very different to the model from the United States, but we shouldn't just rest or, or rely on action through the leadership at the top level. I think we have to look at leaders at all level of society. And here, I think, you know, our institutions are starting to realize that they not, shouldn't just be working with like, you know, the, the top level representative countries, but with mayors, with parliamentarians, with civil society leaders, with religious leaders, with business people. You know, there are people at all levels of uh, economic and social engagement that can take action in these issues that don't have to wait for good leadership above. In fact, will can take leadership that's often lacking when there's a, a vacuum or bad leadership from above and can take leadership at the community level and can coordinate now through our global communication systems with each other without having to go up the top for that communication. We can communicate with each other now in order to coordinate uh, action at different levels. Thank you. Thank you, Alain. David, what about you? What do you think? Uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, what about uh, uh, sustaining peace? What about prevention? 
about inducing peace. I mean, what, what instruments do we have? I mean, many times the voice of the Secretary General is unheard, even when he called for a global ceasefire. What do you think can be done really for prevention? Thank you, uh, Donato. Uh, not that it's uh, unheard, it's unheeded. Yeah. Uh, the voice is always there, but it's unheeded. Um, uh, the Secretary General actually in January 2020 uh, spoke uh, of four horsemen of the apocalypse. And uh, actually, if he had waited for a couple of more weeks, he would have probably spoken of the f five horsemen, which would have been COVID or pandemics. But uh, these four horsemen actually uh, define uh, our our problems today, and uh, these are really uh, low level of relations between the most powerful countries, uh, a climate crisis that's already here, the dark side of technology, uh, which is great to have all these uh, gadgets, but what can those gadgets do when married to military, uh, the military side? And the last is, uh, is a total uh, lack of trust on all levels. Uh, I don't think any of us has a crystal ball or, or ready-made recipes, but what I would say is we need to, uh, as we discussed, we need to change the perception of security. We need to widen it. We need to uh, uh, have it uh, uh, comprehensive. Um, I think it's also important to uh, get rid of, of the um, discussion about how do we change the, uh, how do we make the economy and, and countries more sustainable without hitting on the, on the, the main nail here. And that uh, is we need to, uh, we governments need to find um, legislation that would change the way private enterprise makes a profit. And nothing can be sustainable if a profit is made the way it has been made up to now by uh, basically uh, destroying the environment and uh, maximizing profit, not thinking about the uh, uh, those who, who work in these uh, difficult conditions uh, quite often. Um, politically, I think uh, we need to get rid of a double standard that permeates everything, uh, every discourse, every uh, political initiative is, uh, is based on a double standard. And uh, well, the last one I could express by uh, by uh, popular culture, uh, when the mafia, uh, you know, uh, clashes, and take the Godfather anywhere, they say you gotta uh, give a piece of the action. Everybody wants a piece of the action. So those who have uh, the action need to learn to share it. And in parallel to that, redefining one's uh, quote unquote vital interests is would also be a, a great step forward. Thank you. You can't, I think you need to unmute, Donald. I have to unmute. Uh, Alexander, please uh, be as, as succinct as possible. Thank you. Uh, okay, I will try. But th the biggest question is I understand how we make this world a safer place. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not very optimistic about that because I think our goal should be at least not to multiply new crises all the time. And we are doing that. COVID-19 came as a stress test to many world leaders and practically none of them have passed it. US President Trump has been gambling with people's life, lives in the attempt to, out, to outwit the virus. China's leader willingly or not prevented any collaboration on to contain the pandemic. President Putin has politically locked himself down, leaving all the responsibilities and associated guilt to the Russia's regional authorities. In terms of crisis awareness and prevention, I'm particularly concerned with the trend 
that the world politics is increasingly de defined by the country's internal problems and not the challenges of the world transformation. Or rather, responses to these challenges become more and more the consequence, consequence of internal disruptions exacerbating international contradictions and making them increasingly difficult to untangle. Think about the impacts of U.S. coming elections, stability concerns of the ruling regimes in Russia or China, Brexit agenda of the United Kingdom. Perhaps it was coincidence that China chose the COVID moment to tighten its control around disputed reefs in the South China Sea, arrest the most prominent Democrats in Hong Kong and tear a hole in Hong Kong basic law, but perhaps not. Perhaps it was also a coincidence that Putin introduced the constitutional amendments already approved by Russia's legislature that will allow Mr. Putin to crash through terms limits and stay in power until 2036. But perhaps not, since rulers in many places have realized that now is the perfect time to do outrageous things safe in the knowledge that the rest of the world will barely notice it. It looks obvious that dealing with the COVID crisis today, we have already created many new ones which are bound to explode in the near future. The real world is a staggeringly complex place comprised of levels upon levels of dynamic interacting systems. You get COVID-19 in China, it's a problem for the rest of the world, literally, in a week, week later. Lehman Brothers goes down. Ten years later, we are startled by the right-wing populism wave, worldwide authoritarian swing, and the Black Lives Matter movement across the world. There are fires in the Siberia in Russia, which causes food riots in Africa. U.S. and China fight the trade war. As a result, we face instability and deforestation in Latin America. We are all now deeply interconnected, and the current model of multipolarity with the diverging perspectives of the poles, the states as the only poles of this system, has become not only obsolete, but dangerous on many counts. And the perception uh, or the answer to that was given 100 years ago, exactly by the president to whom um, uh, we have already addressed, President Woodrow Wilson, who said, there must be not a balance of power, but a community of power. We have been trying to achieve it, doing the same thing over and over again with the same outcome. Maybe it's time to do something new. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. I see on my uh, watch here that we have about uh, half an hour. I want to ask uh, uh, our support team uh, if we can go beyond the half an hour allotted that we have as of now. Please uh, send me a message. Uh, now is the turn of, uh, uh, I think, Vaira. Vaira, please. Uh, since we have so many questions, maybe a comment on, on what Alexander just said. I mean, you, you, you also believe in uh, this cascading effect, uh, or you think that we can break this, uh, uh, you know, situation of uh, disaster after disaster, one way or another, through, through of course, prevention, as we said. Uh, Vaira, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Got it. Hope springs eternal in a human breast, says the British poet. And uh, we have no, no other choice but, but hope. But as far as leadership goes, um, I would very much question that the leaders of the past uh, were so terrifically uh, superior to the ones of the present. Uh, they lived at a time when respect for authority, when, uh, when openness and information about what happens at the highest echelons of power was very, very 
severely guarded and, uh, and, and the public was not supposed to know a great many things. So I think that the, the comparison uh, simply, I think that they, they were human in the past and all too human in the present as well. And I would emphasize on the fact that there are different types of leaders within the United Nations. There are those that have been elected by their populations, uh, and wisely or not. Uh, um, this is one of the reasons the United States has so uh, complicated uh, and ponderous and basically undemocratic system of, of presidential elections is because the fathers of their constitution felt that the popular vote could not always be trusted. They did not trust the wisdom of the people to elect the best leaders. Therefore, the electoral votes uh, of the elite uh, would then uh, come and compensate uh, and rectify the matters. Uh, so apart uh, from those who one way or another have been elected and who, uh, as we uh, joke among ourselves in the World Leadership Alliance Club de Madrid, which I led for the previous uh, six years, uh, the, those leaders uh, come into power with an understanding that they unpack their suitcases while they're there in offices. And then when the time comes up, they pack their suitcases and they leave. And then there are all these other leaders uh, that not only do not suffer any kind of expression uh, of uh, dissent or a differing opinion, uh, we're speaking up uh, for your opinions and in many parts of the world is still uh, actually uh, presents a danger to life and limb, never mind security. Uh, you do have, a, we do still have a goodly number of leaders for life or for, uh, for a periods and, and, and terms that keep extended and extended and constitutions modified and so forth. Um, the security of nations depends not just on the leaders and on their economic uh, conditions. Uh, of course, if they have natural resources, that puts them in a class apart. That hardly counts. Um, but on good governance. And it's the question of good governance we haven't even addressed right now. And I would say that one of the problems with great many countries is that once they gain their independence after the collapse of the colonial order of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, a great many countries were not prepared. They did not have the personnel, the educated public that was ready to take over and to ensure good governance. The population was not able to express uh, its wishes and was too easily manipulated, but most of the time it happened by force. I, I would invite all the, the, uh, the listeners uh, on the airwaves um, to have a look at the, at the film Blood Diamonds and you'll get a sense of that the armaments are not just a matter for countries um, engaging in arming for their own security. There's a whole weapons trade, there's an illegal international weapons trade. It's one of the most profitable areas of money making in the world. And various commodities, uh, whose value changes, of course, with, uh, with supply and demand, uh, such as diamonds or, or rare metals, rare earths and so forth, um, become, uh, become the object of armed groupings. And Africa and Central Africa particularly has suffered from it over decades. Uh, here again, I spent six years with the International Criminal Court at The Hague, uh, uh, sitting and representing Eastern Europe uh, on its trust fund for victims. And when you see the sort of suffering that the population suffer from completely ungovernmental armed bands, who do receive their weapons from interested parties who provide them for them, or other parts of the world where religious intolerance is being used to uh, increase centuries old hatreds, to, to, to sort of uh, to heat the fires of, of fate, of hate and, 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 and distrust and uh, despising their neighbors. Um, all this is going on and the concentration of wealth contributes to it. The, the, the fact that more and more obscenely, fewer and fewer people in the world are concentrating resources in their own hands 
there, if this continues, at some point, governments will become obsolete. They will simply not be players anymore, as opposed to not just international corporations, uh, but also private, private wealth, um, wealthy individuals for one reason or another who have amassed sometimes hidden wealth with which they can manipulate um, in all sorts of manners. So that all in all, uh, I think uh, the outlook means that both national and international bodies have to think about how we can ensure more and more at least countries in the world that have reasonably good governance uh, before we can proceed further with with our hopes and 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 and, and prayers for for a better humanity. Uh, thank you very much, Vaira. Uh, I want to let you know, by the way, that we have about 130, an average 130 participants at our session today. You may have seen that, and kindly, our panelists are also responding via chat to some of the questions that are coming up. We will not be able to address them all, actually very few, perhaps at the end of this debate that is now extended up to uh, 5.30 p.m. Central European time. So the next one to speak is Tibor. Tibor, I know how dear uh, uh, is this theme to you, uh, the, the theme of, uh, uh, of prevention. So maybe a, a word from you, not, not too many words, but a word from you in terms of how you think things are happening uh, for the prevention of uh, father crisis. Uh, unmute yourself, Tibor, please. Unmute yourself. Um, yes. L let me start with, uh, with the lack of leadership. And um, the, the, there was a referencing in the previous questions about the lack of systemic response. And uh, there might be two ways of looking upon it. Uh, number one, um, the, the depths and the widths of the crisis is such that probably it's not easy to find quick solutions from problems which have been accumulated for one, two, three or four decades by now. And those leaders who, who have been elected out of frustration of the people uh, uh, hungry for explanations and hungry for solutions. And those who are waving um, uh, waves of, uh, who are, who are ri uh, riding waves of populism. So that sort of transformational leadership is a leadership we do not need. And we have to be, we have to be uh, beware that as we go forward and in case the situation is not improving, uh, the way, uh, we will see uh, more and more leaders being elected and having uh, quick solutions. So based on that, um, it's not just a question of jumping from one issue, one crisis to another, but the question is what kind of solutions are suggested. And this is where the role of the intergovernmental organizations and different arrangements are coming in because they have to be a counterweight of solid, reliable information and action. And I mentioned earlier that uh, they are coming into the crossfire of some of the geopolitical and other exchanges. So it's extremely important, Notwithstanding the difficulties that these organizations retain as much as possible their integrity. Because at the national level, they might remain one of the few trustworthy source of information, of important information, like uh, we, we did see in the case of, of the COVID uh, crisis. The, the second element is that on action as well, there might be very few governments who after, uh, after the dust hopefully will settle post-crisis, will have the resources to deal with different issues. And the question was raised about the lack of systemic approach. And this is a bit of a deficiency of the intergovernmental organizations, though I see as an advantage. They are not everywhere on the map. They have mandates, those are strictly defined, but they have money 
uh, and resources to carry out those mandates. So the, the advantage is that many of these specialized organizations or arrangements are not just uh, talk shows, but in case uh, they have the traction and they have the right leadership within the organization, uh, they can do things. This is bringing me to the type of leadership what might be needed in those organizations because I do think that based on some of the populism prevailing um, at, uh, at the level of national leadership, there is a need to go for more distributed leadership within the organizations themselves, which means to empower the different layers of decision-making within those organizations. And I don't think that they are faring uh, very well. To empower women within those organizations, to be less hierarchical age-wise. So it's not a question of how many years you have been in an organization or when you were born, but what you can bring to the table uh, in specialized technical organizations, of course, the rule should be observed that people who are older than 30 might not contribute too much in terms of innovative thinking on, on some of the technically complex issues. So there is, a, there is a full range of possibilities for these organizations, but in terms of the systemic approach, besides the sustainable development goal, um, general assembly action, there are very few fora in the United Nations system which can look upon things systemically, okay? Uh, it could be the, the meetings of the chief executives, okay? There is a board of the chief executives, but it's a rare event and they, this is more exchanging information than trying to map in a systemic way uh, what, what can, be, can be done. So I will stop here. Yes, I mute myself. We have another round of questions. Um, again, please be concise as much as possible. Uh, but I will continue with you, Tibor, because uh, we mentioned also other players. Um, multilateralism is not just about states. Uh, it's about multinationals, corporations, special groups, civil society organizations. So who is in charge? Who do you think is in charge and who can manage this growing multi-layered multi complex? Um, I, I think we should, uh, we should have a look at um, uh, where developments are bringing us. So I see number one as a result of this uh, unprecedented redistribution of uh, resources um, as, a, as a response to, to the economic and financial uh, crisis. Uh, uh, practically 10 trillion dollars uh, is, is the uh, level uh, what uh, we are speaking about. It's uh, putting uh, states in a stronger position. So we will have to face that after many, many years of decline of the influence of states because of this redistributive power accepted by the societies is putting states uh, in, a, in a stronger uh, driving seat position. At the same time, it's creating a headache for many of those um, decision makers how to inject additional resources into the economy, how to handle unemployment problems in a way that it would make sense. So it's not a waste of uh, uh, money and, and resources. And this is again where some of the um, UN entities, intergovernment organizations, and other entities can come in. It could be a coalition uh, supported by, by civil society, uh, supported by entities like, like uh, or own academy, uh, Club of Rome, Rome, and others. But there is a need to give ideas. The other tendency is um, that uh, those entities which are representing what I call new technologies and new industries, uh, they are getting stronger and stronger. And uh, Vaira made the point to what they represent. So like 
uh, like the, the level where Amazon is, it might be $1.5 trillion, which is, which is huge, or some of the personal wealth might be between one and $200 billion. So the, these entities have a much stronger influence, not just by the um, uh, sheer weight they represent in the economy, but uh, through lobbying and through other entities. Uh, this is again where intergovernmental organizations can be the right counterweight, both from the point of view of regulation and both from the point of view of bringing the right information to, to those who are interested in, in that information. And there is a need, there is a need for uh, some of the entities uh, quietly uh, relying again on the inputs of academia, on the inputs of civil society to see what are the new areas of regulation. And there is a lot of talk uh, about artificial intelligence, uh, about how the social media uh, should and should not behave. So th there are many areas where, of course, one has to be careful not to try to uh, put too much regulation in, but at the same time to do uh, something, uh, something meaningful. So in, in, all these, in all these areas, um, uh, there, is a, there, is a, there is a need to address uh, the, the, the new landscape, and the landscape is changing uh, as we see. And uh, again, uh, there will be a moment when the dust will settle. And at that moment, of course, it will matter who has the best uh, fine print about some of the next layer of solutions. And this is where, again, uh, these entities, IGOs, other arrangements can be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Tibor. Uh, David, uh, could, I, could I hear your point of view around this? In, uh, who are these new players? Do we have new players in uh, multilateralism? And uh, do you think that we should support them? Or do they from themselves, like uh, uh, Fridays for Future or other youth um, organizations, what, what is their weight what, and, and how can they transform if they can? David, before you start, can I just, because I'm not sure you, you know, I need to leave in 15 minutes. I apologize. This is Sandrine. So may I yield, may I yield to Sandrine, please? No, yes. no, David, please. No, no, please go, go ahead. ahead. I'm serious. I'm I didn't serious. want to go before you. I'm sorry. I was oh, go, just funny please. to say there's no, there's no rhyme or reason to the order. It's uh, okay. Donato's just trying to be, you know, equally. Uh, please, please. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Well, I didn't want to step on any toes. Apologies for that. Sandrine, we have so few moments in life to uh, make believe that we're gentlemen that uh, I'd like to use this one. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, you're being an absolute gentleman. So thank you, Donato, and thank you, David. Um, I just wanted to, to add in here because I, I think that this is really bringing us to the crux of how we can balance multilateralism with the shift in stakeholder engagement. And, and having been very close to the UNFCCC and the way in which we saw the development of the stakeholder process around the Paris Agreement on Climate, I wanted to reflect on, and also at that time, my work at Sustainable Energy for All as being Chief Partnership Officer as one of the UN agencies. What I think we're starting to see, and you're very right in terms of these new stakeholders and also the new balance of power, which is no longer just heads of state, but very much trickling across a variety of different stakeholders through different parts of government, all the way down to the local level, as well as through different types of actors. I think looking at the successes and within the UN family, and I know that the Secretary General right now is very much trying to do this, of how we bring in new stakeholders and existing stakeholders. So obviously working with the business community, we've seen a huge change in our exchange with the finance sector, not just through the World Bank, but also through the way in which we, we are looking at um, the uh, other IFOs and IFIs and, and also the way in which we're looking at the central banks and the incredible work that, that Carney has done on looking at stress testing, investments, et cetera. So, so I think we need to first look at the successes. 
then we clearly need to see at what level, and this is where much of the discussion on the chat has been, you know, obviously multilateralism is not dead. It just needs to be reinvigorated and reinvented based on a 21st century model, which brings in those stakeholders very much the new leadership. I mean, we see again the new ambassadors for the Secretary General, people like Paul Pullman, people like Fika Sabesma that are leaders within the business community. But then there is an element that we really need to see how we can make a shift, which is to ensure that we look at full value chains and ensure, and that's across government as well as across business and across the multidisciplinary aspect of the systems approach that we're trying to foster. How do we bring in the gilets jaunes for a conversation with the youth? The gilets jaunes who are basically saying, you need to protect my end of the month, and the youth who are saying, you need to protect the end of the world. How do we unpack some of those really difficult conversations? And can we do it in a much more diplomatic setting and the convening that, that Alexander was talking about and you were talking about, Donato, either through the Club of Rome or the others um, who, who could really, the Club of Madrid, who also have that joint convening power, WBCSD, the WEF, of bringing the right people together to have those conversations. So I think that is the way that we can really start to measure success, is enabling those voices to come to the table at all levels. We're doing a lot of that, all of us, in the way in which we're bringing the youth. Fridays for the Future is very much becoming increasingly active. We have youth representatives within the UN. And then I'll make one last point, which is the work that we're doing on COP26 and, and with the UK government. We need to start thinking about radical collaborations. That's why I brought up the Gilets Jaunes and I brought up the youth. They're not used to talking to each other. We need to figure out how we can do that within the UN institutions, but also between the institutions and different stakeholders so that we don't continue to have the same people in the room, because this has been a big problem at all levels and one that we see very much in the environmental community. So is this your final uh, comment, Sandrine, because we have to let you go at some point, I understand, or you still have some time with us? I, I will I'd be able to stay for, for another seven minutes. Um, I've already, I'm a little late for my, my other an, meeting. An, an, an extra minute, but really one minute, just to give us your, your word, your final message. Uh, what is the final message that we should carry home for the continuation of our exercise? Well, first of all, I very much hope that we've just developed a nice little new network and a new community amongst all of us. Um, I felt that there was a great deal of like-mindedness and real true deep leadership in, in many of the thoughts that were coming through. So I very much hope we can build on this conversation. I believe it's necessary that we continue to build and bring in some of the other actors that we've all mentioned, and maybe we can think about that through WAS, through the UN, in ensuring that we really do unpack those difficult conversations. I'm quite hopeful. I, I really believe that we are faced, as I said, with the greatest existential risk ever to hit humankind. And yet by the same token, I feel that if we don't get this right now, we have no other choice, but also this will be the greatest moment in our history to demonstrate that we can be humble that we can finally demonstrate to all parts of society what real leadership looks like. And as I said, hold each other and others accountable for their actions. So we need to be vocal. We need to stop pussyfooting around, but we need to come up with solutions. That is complex. That is difficult, absolutely. But then again, living is not easy. There's a lot of gray area, and therefore we need to ensure that we hit hard in some of those difficult conversations, otherwise we'll never make it. So I, I guess I'll leave it at that. And I wanna thank you for the privilege of being able to be on this panel. And I very much hope to work with all of you. Thank you, Sandrine. It's been our honor and our pleasure having you with us today. And we continue, we continue with uh, Alexander. Alexander, uh, it's your turn to elaborate a bit on this particular subject, uh, that is, uh, uh, who is with us? Uh, it's not just states, it's not just 
corporations. It's not just youth. Who else do you see coming on board? Uh, again, you have to unmute yourself, sorry. Can you unmute yourself? Yes, I have done it. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, now listen, <clears throat> I think that firstly, the pandemics and its consequences have tragically put on display that traditional sovereign state-based multilateralism looks more and more obsolete. And the contours of this trend have materialized in the recent legal claims against sovereign state, China, filed by the states of Missouri and Mississippi. And not only, the new actors already entering the politics. The state maintains so far monopoly on certain policies areas, that's undisputable, but non-state actors play an increasingly important role at the stage of defining the problem, analyzing the problem links, and ultimately shaping the political discourse. The Danish government recently decided to establish a post of the ambassador responsible for relationship not with another foreign state, but with the corporations. The digital ambassador of Denmark will be facilitating relationship between Denmark and Apple, Google and Microsoft. The last year, the French followed suit. Big data companies, Google, Facebook, etc., have already assumed many functions previously associated with the state. From cartography, now we use only telephones to navigate anywhere, to surveillance, cameras are also. Now they are the primary gatekeepers of social reality. People today engage in social issues, mainly through civil society and the use of social media as their primary tool. And not only, even global leaders are carrying out foreign policy by Twitter and WhatsApp for better or for worse. Facebook this year has reached almost 3 billion users, a biggest, let me say, entity in the world. This holds fascinating prospects for de facto global citizenship and social action, but it does undermine the nation-based representative model of democracy. We have to deal with this as well. The role mega cities and provinces played in planning and organizing the response during the pandemics becoming in fact decisive actors across the globe in this struggle could dramatically redesign the essential services provision in a more resilient fashion in future man-made or natural disasters defined less by national identity and more by human security quality of services and well-being they provide to the people living within the municipal areas. The pandemic has seemingly boosted the process of deglobalization, and many people are talking about that. However, this is not a crisis of globalization, but a crisis of financial and economic neoliberal globalization based on the belief that social benefits and regulations were a burden on the economy that hampered growth and that a rising tide lifts all the boats according to the famous adage of the neoliberal thought. However, contrary to the expectations, the tidal wave has overturned many boats. Consequently, regional integration is challenging and sometimes replacing the global one. Subnational structures, mega cities and provinces empowered by digital technology and capable of responding at faster speeds than states have already started to enter into their own trade agreements, public health agreements, the climate change accords with other cities globally via direct multilateral relations on this level. But all means 
by all means, the list is not exhaustive and there might be many more possible stakeholders to assume that it will dramatically accelerate the much of history. But today's circumstances call for an updated operating system of the world. Call it effective multilateralism or plurilateralism that is based not only on Westphalian sovereign states pattern, but involves also nascent stakeholders of the global international society. The gap between the expanding networked plurilateral world and governance traditionally understood and applied within post-Westphalian concepts is widening and feeding disorder and disruptiveness of the global system. And this gap, will not be bridged by any new iterations of a traditional unipolar, bipolar, or even multipolar global world order. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Alexander. Vaira, please, uh, a comment from you on these particular aspects of other players in multilateral affairs. Please unmute yourself doing that am Thank i you. am i unmuted now oh, oh, i are. see <laughs> uh alexander alluded to the regionalization that is going on simultaneously with the globalization that we know at the level of information exchanges and this brings to mind the situation in the middle ages when cities were growing up uh, on the basis of uh, growth of trade uh, and uh, uh, the rise of various uh, trades and professions, uh, when uh, city-states did not report to a prince or a king or to a, to a, to a sort of uh, national entity, um, but directly to the Holy Roman Emperor, sometimes to the Pope, and there were leagues like the Hanseatic League, where cities linked together, uh, quite independently of their kings and princes under which the, their territory happened to lie. We seem to have gone through hopefully a spiral and not a repetition uh, of, the, of the Middle Ages, um, but there is this real need among the population uh, to feel a closeness uh, to uh, the governance to which they're, uh, of which they are part uh, in terms of uh, distance or the psychological distance they feel with those who take decisions. Uh, we have a problem in the European Union uh, about the parliamentary elections for the European Parliament attracting um, an alarmingly low percentage of, of the population. Why? Because people feel that, oh, well, once we send a deputy, and especially in the case of a small country, a handful of deputies off to Brussels, they're gone off to the good life and, and they have said goodbye to us and, and they're really of no relevance to our concerns and, and to our problems. Uh, in this vacuum of trust and, uh, and of uh, relationship, uh, non-governmental bodies, I think, are playing an increasingly important role. Now, the, and for decades now, the United Nations, every time it had a, a serious conference on something like, I remember participating one in Durban, South Africa, about racism and xenophobia. Just before the heads of state met uh, officially, there was a, you might say, a parallel Durban conference of non-governmental civil society uh, mm -hmm. happening. The, the difference between the two uh, is that civil society truly represents the grassroots feelings, but of the people that are part of it. Uh, there may be civil society groups that are uh, just as much against each other uh, as any nation states might be. It does not mean just because they call themselves civil that they are representing universally accepted uh, values. You may have civil society groups for abortion, you may have them against abortion, and sometimes, as we know, they can get quite violent um, in expressing uh, their views. Uh, nevertheless, uh, 
uh, I think that this is a, an increasingly important avenue for citizens to activate themselves, to inform themselves, uh, to uh, feel uh, the ability to change events and to dire take the dir political direction of their political leaders uh, by presenting certain demands that until then had been ignored. Uh, the, the abolition of slavery took uh, a great deal of effort and even a civil war in the United States and, and, and about a hundred years of, of effort by people like Wilberforce to, to actually accept in Parliament that uh, slavery was not acceptable. Uh, the vote for women came extraordinarily late uh, in France, which had its uh, revolution, uh, uh, as we know, quite a, quite a time before that. And I think the last in Europe was Switzerland that finally gave the right of vote to women. It's extraordinary that some cantons to the end or simply. Uh, the Vienna Philharmonic wouldn't have women because they took it for granted that women do not play as well as men, etc., etc. So that uh, civil society has played an enormous, and, and sometimes individuals, uh, single individuals, like Henri Dunant in creating the Red Cross, uh, going simply out on the battlefield and picking up soldiers from both sides and tending to their wounds. Um, single individuals, never mind organizations, can change the world. Thank you, Vaira. David, uh, it's your turn, please. Uh, just Thank you. Particular element we said, what are the other players and how can we bring them together in a more meaningful way? Thank you, Donato. You know, we have uh, collectively and individually uh, during this panel been on average pretty pessimistic uh, about the pro problems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, maybe realistic, not pessimistic. But um, I would like to um, uh, inject a uh, um, a little bit of uh, optimism and that optimism of mine is based on the fact that we have had a, a flash if you will of uh, of the understanding of modern multilateralism and it came five years ago um, almost five years ago uh, in December 2015 when the same member states and the same countries and same players who can't seem to agree on anything today, actually managed to agree to the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, agreed to the, the Paris uh, Climate, uh, at the Paris Climate Summit, agreed to financing for development, and thus created elements that are the building blocks of this multilateral uh, future. And incidentally, it wasn't just the member states. I don't remember the exact figures, but there were tens of thousands of people involved, either in situ or uh, virtually, in the run-up to this uh, unusual December 2015 that saw so many uh, things happen. So the players are there. The institutions uh, are there. Uh, we just need to not forget what happened in December 2015. We need to build on that. We need to go ahead. And uh, but for this, uh, there is no, uh, unfortunately, no um, indication of any political will. And that's what's missing. I have a question uh, here from uh, one of our listeners. Uh, may I answer it live uh, here? Um, it is from... Uh, 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 from Anastasia Lavrina uh, from Baku, from the uh, television channel uh, Caspian Broadcasting Corporation. She says, that, uh, how do you see the role of the UN in the post-pandemic world in regard to peace building and conflict resolution? Do you think that the UN should get more power in this activity or it should be more states oriented? Thank you for the question, Anastasia. Um, I think the role of the UN or its uh, evolution uh, pre or post-pandemic doesn't really depend on the pandemic. Um, the uh, role of the UN in peace building and conflict resolution uh, is and uh, should be central, but it should be central 
with the consent of the member states. And this answers your second question, should it be, should the UN be more uh, uh, states oriented? The United Nations is an organization of member states. That is um, its uh, strong side and it's also its weak point. Uh, so we don't have a choice as the UN uh, organization, meaning an organization of member states, they call the shots. My, what I've been complaining about throughout this panel discussion is they don't call those shots regularly and to the extent that they should. Um, and another aspect is that uh, members of a golf club, uh, if they want to continue being members of the golf club, should pay their dues. Um, so the, uh, the, the difference between pre-pandemic and post-pandemic I don't think is going to uh, be crucial. Uh, the pandemic will play a huge role in the post-pandemic world if it does uh, uh, appear in, in full uh, and not partially will be a different landscape, but I'll talk about it maybe a little later uh, at the end. Um, one thing that I wanted to, since I'm on the UN and uh, leadership, um, I wanted to uh, uh, clarify that uh, I'm not, uh, you know, overly, um, uh, overly enthralled with the leadership of the past and I certainly was not referring to the personal failings or lack thereof of individual leaders. I was referring actually to something that makes a leader. When a leader thinks and works and, uh, and uh, performs for the country, for its people and not uh, works towards the next poll. Uh, and the next election. That's what I was referring to. And uh, unfortunately, the latter kind I see more and more uh, now than I used to uh, before. But then uh, uh, the past is always, oh, the past always has greener pastures. So uh, maybe it's it's uh, not. Uh, uh, so let me let me uh, stop there. I'll give you a chance to uh, continue. Uh, another round of, uh, of questions, but we really, we have exhausted our time. So it will be really a closing message from all of you. Uh, and uh, uh, Aline, yes, is next. Aline, I will ask you to couple uh, this last question that I raised that is uh, based on uh, the need to involve other actors in this debate, not just states. But I would like also uh, to have a final message from you because really we have exhausted our time. Let me also say I'm terribly sorry, Donato. Uh, since it's the uh, last word, it was the last word, and I didn't know about it. May I just use use, use Aline's uh, just thirty seconds to say that uh, you know making uh, prophecies is not something that people do in in uh, real life and in politics. But uh, what I can say, I think, is that a uh, hundred years from now, the thirty years from 1990 to uh, whatever, 2020, uh, uh, maybe 25, will be a moment in history that uh, people will forget because we are transitioning to something. And what we transition to is going to be the thing that historians afterwards refer to. Uh, this transitional phase is, is hardly going to be visible. But the key here is we should not, uh, we should try to not destroy the world while we're looking for the new paradigm or whatever new arrangement we want to make. Thank you and sorry, Ellen. I, I wanted to give you a final word, David, but now you, you, are, you took it already. So I don't know if we will have time for another extra word in the end. Uh, but you, you said the right thing at the right moment. So Alan, please uh, come in at this very moment. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to the people who have been writing questions in the question and answer box, which is down the bottom. Some of us panelists have been writing answers to the questions in the, the panel box here because we knew we wouldn't have time uh, to do it uh, uh, verbally. So remain, let me say that it will remain with us, those questions on the World Academy um, website, and they can be answered later on. Actually, they will be answered later on. I know that you will take time uh, to answer those questions that you find particularly meaningful for us. Thank you. Uh, continue, Ali. Thank you. I, yes, and I was reporting that some of us have been answering them while we've been in between speaking. So there's some, some answers here already. 
Um, with regards to some of the key actors, um, I did provide actually in one of the answers there uh, some aspects about youth, which I thought were really important, and that is uh, helping youth to connect the issues, uh, climate, peace, sustainable development. These are interrelated issues that young people are speaking up about um, and the more powerful if they're working together. So there are some projects that are helping to, to join those voices together, but also to think not just about youth voices, but about intergenerational dialogue. We can learn from each other. You know, there's a vitality, there's a freshness, there's new creative ideas and communication styles from young people. Those of us who've been involved in longer know a little bit more about the systems and how you can turn these, this, you know, the calls from the young people into policy action. Um, and so that ne the next point I was going to mention was on policies. In order to engage people, we can't just like fire them up over what's bad and criticism and protest. We need to give them hope that something positive can happen. So that's highlighting success stories, good policies, effective policies that are working, then give people something to call for, not just something to call against. So highlighting good policies is very, very important. And World Future Council, which Alexander Lika told and I are council members of, so that's the main focus of it, is to highlight effective policies for fu future generations. Thirdly, I want to emphasize the really important role of legislators. I recognize what Vaira was saying, that there is a lack of trust by a large number of people in the parliamentarians. And it's true, there are some parliamentarians who don't share these ideas of human security, who may be corrupt, who may be there to advance the vested interests of some corporations who may be even helping their election campaigns. But there are also many, many legislators, whether at the federal level or the local level, who are there because they want to make a change and make a difference, and they need our help. And we need to help civil society to engage effectively with the legislators to help turn, again, the cry for action into, into good policy. So that's something that's important, that there are parliamentary organisations which are focusing on specific issues, like the one I'm organised uh, involved in is focusing on disarmament. Uh, they're really good to engage with, but there's also the inter, uh, regional parliamentary bodies where the parliamentarians come together and share good practice and experience, like the Interparliamentary Union, which has 178 member parliaments, or the Parliamentary Assembly of the Organisation for Securing Cooperation in Europe, which has 56 parliaments. And these are really good interparliamentary assemblies to engage with, again, to take forward cooperative policies. Uh, thirdly, women is really, really important, the role of women in the UN processes, and this has been recognised by the UN Secretary General on the disarmament field. It's part of the UN Secretary General's disarmament agenda. I can give an example from our area of the world. The Bougainville Civil War, which was raging for 10 years, would not have been resolved if the women weren't brought into the negotiating process. They were the ones who, who provided a context then to encourage the rebels to lay down their arms and also the government forces to, to join the process. And they gave the idea that the peacekeeping force to come in should be an unarmed peacekeeping force. And they gave support for that. So highlighting the role of women is really, really important. And they said the UN Secretary General's disarmed agenda is focusing on that and its various initiatives on that. And finally, like-minded groups. The UN is comprised of what is it, 192 or 193 countries. Now the P5 have a lot of power on the Security Council, know that, and that's why it's really difficult getting things through there. But in the General Assembly, they're a minority. And it's through the General Assembly and through ECOSOC that like-minded groups are making an impact. When we wanted to challenge nuclear weapons and we had to get a resolution in the International Court of Justice and we had to get a resolution through the General Assembly, we got the non-aligned movement to introduce it and we had a majority straight away. For Paris, the alliance of small island states was really effective in actually bringing the issues that climate change is actually happening now to the, par to the table in, in Paris and President Obama highlighted the role of the alliance of small island states. So looking at these regional groupings, they can help to bring in um, good policy, a political lobbying impact, and to counter the retroactive forces that are within the systems. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. You also passed your last message that we will mm -hmm. safely for further analysis as well. Uh, Alexander, I see you. I don't know if uh, Tibor is with us. Uh, Tibor, can you switch on your camera because you will be next. Uh, I know you already answered, Tibor, would you uh, give us some positive examples? I think that 
both David uh, and, and uh, Alan have stressed the fact that we need also to, 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 to end our discussion with some positive signs of uh, an evolutionary uh, positive uh, uh, direction that we could give. What could you say in that sense? Uh, you are, you're muted, sorry. You're muted, Thibaut. Thank you. Yes. Um, thanks for this uh, push. Um, I, I am absolutely uh, convinced that, uh, number one, we will put behind us uh, these challenging times. And uh, number two, we will not come out of, of um, this set of crises uh, weakened, by, but strengthened. But for that, we have to look into the face of what is ahead of us in a realistic way, okay? And um, undertake action at different level. So in this panel, we were focusing on uh, multilateralism, global organizations. So I am much closer uh, with my heart and with my brain to that community. And uh, my feeling is that we can do a lot uh, within the existing system, even with uh, a depletion, an inevitable depletion of some of the budgetary contributions. But we have to uh, approach things in a, in, in a new way. We, we have to uh, give more power uh, to, to those people, hundreds of them uh, in organizations, thousands of them in the UN system, who can make a difference at their own level. Uh, we, have to, we have to bring in uh, some of the new players through education. I, I would love to see that um, uh, many of these organizations who are depository of information, knowledge and wisdom in an unparalleled way that they are sharing more and more. Right now, this is not the case. Uh, education uh, and in eventually the intersection of education and employment will be an important break on the point. And this is again where the whole UN system uh, can be relevant. I would love to have a meeting in October uh, in uh, what is called the Council Chamber of the Palais de Nation. This is a, a, a room which used to be the room of the former uh, Council of the League of Nations uh, with uh, allegorical decoration by, by a Spanish um, uh, artist, Jose Maria Cert and to look into the face of those messages which are on the war between the choices and the challenges, and to have as many, as many uh, heads of intergovernment organizations who can tell us and tell themselves what they are doing to come out of this crisis strengthened. So I, I, I would hope that we could do that in a, in a setting which, which would be the appropriate setting uh, in the context of all these challenges. And thank you so much. Uh, it, was, it was fascinating to, to listen to, to all, uh, all the interventions and uh, an amazing uh, interest by participants judging from the questions. Thanks a lot. Absolutely. Thank you, Tibor. And thank you also for reminding us of the possibility of asking David if we can borrow that council room once more uh, as it is particularly inspirational. Uh, and uh, Alexander, uh, maybe picking up on what uh, our previous speakers have said. Uh, Hello. Thank you, Donata. I will be very brief. Uh, yes. First, I'm skeptical regarding the claims that the world will be different after this crisis. The world is continuously morphing and has never changed abruptly. The current crisis will not be so much a turning point, but a catalyst, an activator that brutally will reveal and intensify the trends 
that uh, have already existed in the world. However, this crisis by all means will dramatically boost the speed of this change. And clearly during this speed up process, when the current world will undoubtedly end up seriously changed, much will depend upon the action of every one, everybody, states, governments, civil society, and the higher level of synergy we will reach between all stakeholders, the better results we will achieve. Thank you. And thanks everybody for fascinating meeting. And especially I want to ask our, to, to thank our audience who was active, asked the question, and I think it will be our duty to answer at least the most uh, important ones. Thank you very much, Alexander. Uh, I would come to Vaira now, and uh, one of the questions actually that we received uh, follows the same vein. I mean, and the front was from Zam, uh, Lion Zam, um, some time ago, but I want to, to read it again. What this person, what this participant said is that it, there's probably a big change now in decision making. I mean, or there should be a, a different way of uh, elaborating the decision making process uh, in the post COVID era. Do you see signs of that? Again, do you see positive signs that something is changing in shaping up a more collective, more, uh, 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 let's say, more cohesive way uh, of uh, uh, responding to challenges such as the ones that we are confronted with? Can you unmute yourself uh, again? I think we have the... Yeah. I believe in your thing. Um, we can only hope that uh, the the pandemic will be stimulus to uh, greater communication between countries when they take uh, decisions uh, that involve uh, the health and the security uh, of their citizens. Uh, the European Union um, was not a good example in that sense. I remember being in Paris last fall uh, celebrating uh, the 30 years anniversary of the fall of the wall, wall of Berlin and, and mentioning in my speech that the, when we talk about European security there is uh, there is insufficient coordination of effort, uh, insufficient uh, complementarity in the investments that are made in our security, uh, but that we also do not have emergency reaction um, mechanisms in place and especially mechanisms of, of communication and of, of uh, extraordinary fast decision making in terms, as I mentioned at the time, before the pandemic, I talked about the need for do so for pandemics. And then we discovered that, for instance, when uh, humanitarian aid uh, was being sent from Sweden uh, in an urgent situation to Italy uh, um, and later to Spain, France had already closed its borders and other countries had closed their borders. In other words, um, nation states are using their sovereign rights and thinking about their citizens in response to the fears of the citizens, but they were not. Uh, they were not cooperating uh, in terms of the distribution uh, of resources uh, and of humanitarian aid. This is the sort of thing that I think the COVID-19 has forcefully brought to uh, the attention of the general public, uh, of governments, of parliamentarians, of uh, non-governmental bodies. And I think that uh, a lot of improvisation took place, a lot of very creative solutions were engaged in, and this momentum, I hope that this momentum is maintained, uh, and that uh, initiatives of, of cooperation and mutual aid uh, will continue. The Nizami Jinganjavi International Center, for instance, uh, which is located in Baku, uh, was sending uh, was sending actually uh, pizzas to, to the doctors in, in Milan um, at a time uh, when they were working overtime, and nobody else had thought about it. It's a it's a you might seem a trivial detail, but it, it's very 
it's very meaningful to the people who actually, as I have talked to doctors, uh, working in these protective suits uh, apparently uh, is an ex extremely uh, trying, uh, trying condition. Um, there's a lot that we have shown being capable of in terms of collaboration. So if we could keep that momentum, let's keep in mind that together we are stronger than when we are alone. Uh, together uh, we can achieve more than we can do on our own. Uh, working together with a common purpose and, and a clear purpose uh, and, and means that are that do not harm anybody, you know, not doing it at the expense of anybody else. I think this is something that will accelerate the change that is bound to come. I agree with Alexander, we have been changing all the time. These 30 years during which my country actually <laughs> renewed its independence and, and its democratic status, uh, I would not write them off and throw them into the dustbin of history. They have been crucial for my nation and for my people. Uh, and, and they will be the basis on which we build our future. So uh, okay. let us think of, of, of what has happened as, as a given, uh, a sort of you know, platform where we jump off into the future, hopefully, uh, with a better understanding of what we're facing. And uh, mostly, I must say, determination to do something is the most important thing. You've, when you have determination, a clear goal, you find the means, one way or another, the means will come to you. Thank you, Vaira. This would be the perfect words to end uh, our debate today. Uh, but uh, I have a co-host, uh, David, and I would like really to give him the possibility of saying a final word uh, in terms of how you see us going from here. Uh, and uh, David, to you, please. Well, um, I don't want to have two final words uh, and have any advantage, but uh, since uh, Tibor did raise that issue, I want to say that uh, it is up to uh, His Excellency COVID-19 to uh, tell us what happens down, uh, down the line in October. If things go well and we are more or less back into the swing of things, uh, we already have a reservation for 27, 28 October in your favorite uh, chamber, Tibor. And that's, uh, that's where we were uh, before and that's, I hope, we will be again. And we really, uh, the Director General really is looking forward to being able to host uh, the, the main event in October. Thank you. So let's keep up with this promise and thanks to everybody. Before closing, I want to remind you all that we have other panels ongoing, one on employment, it is particularly interesting. And so you can click on your conversation, on your chat to the right and join that chat, that, uh, that conversation, that debate if you wish. I want just to remember that this has been a, an extraordinary opportunity for, for me, for all of us, I hope. Uh, really to exchange views uh, about how things should be done differently. And uh, I want to remember the sentence of one of the founding fathers of the World Academy of Art and Science, Robert Oppenheimer, that wrote, if a prospect is not a prophecy, it is a view. Meaning that we are not all prophets, but views can make the difference. 